right, amen. The beauty of the church, that's our new sermon series we're in. Um, super excited to, to be here with you this morning. If you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. Uh, I'm the lead uh, teaching pastor and on the preaching team and super uh, grateful to just talk about the beauty of the church. If you weren't here for the beginning of the series, we're really looking at uh, God's design for the church. So God uh, instituted the, the church. It's a divine institution. That means God, God's, uh, I mean, just church family and there's purpose here. Christ is the center of the church. That's why we have a preaching team. It doesn't matter who's up here. Christ is the cornerstone. He's the, uh, he's the chief shepherd. And, and as people come under uh, the lordship of Christ, they meet Jesus as their savior. He tends to their wounds. So all of us are wounded coming in here uh, just differently. But G Jesus binds us up uh, in our brokenness. Uh, he gives us a eternal hope. Not a temporal hope, but an eternal hope. Um, circumstantially, there's so many things that are so hard. Trials are going to come at us, but it, it gets our eyes off of the here and now onto eternal things, namely the hope of Jesus Christ. And then it sets our feet on the foundation of truth. This, the word of God is truth. And so we're interacting in a world that's constantly vying to, to really conform our minds to the patterns of, of different uh, trains of thoughts and narratives. But the word of God is where we come to say, here's what's true. Here's what's real, and it sets our feet on a foundation that is uns uh, unshakable. And as we come under, uh, really, the banner of Christ, this banner of truth, it renews our minds, and it sends us out as missionaries. So you have a part to play. That's why in that video it just says, hey, the church is not a building. I mean, we gather in a facility to hear the word of God, the hope of Jesus Christ, and then our hope is that we would go out as the church of God, as missionaries, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, uh, to share the good news of our risen Savior. Again, the church is a divine institution. It's beautiful, it's powerful, and it's essential for every single person in here to belong not only to Christ, but to a local body declaring the excellence of Jesus. So last week, we looked at the beauty of belonging. This week, we'll be looking at the warmth of of a welcome, the warmth of welcoming. And that's what we hope to have as an environment at the Door Church. So if you have a Bible, grab it. We'll be in James 2, 1 through 13. It's a case study. If the church has been called by God to show the warmth of Christ, we need to, to have some uh, instruction here, and I would even say some heart work. So the warmth of welcoming is a sermon title. Uh, we'll be looking primarily at James chapter 2, 1 through 13. So uh, one thing that I love about the Door Church is our hospitality team. Uh, Lord willing, we are the most hos hospitable, welcoming church there is. Not that we like we're scoreboarding, but we should be welcoming. Um, as people are coming in, we want, we want to say, we see you. We see you. Eye contact. We're glad that you're here. Because a lot of people are wondering, is it okay to come in here? Because everyone I said is wounded, they're broken, they're sinners, that you're accepted here. And so, man, as we greet people with a smile, uh, a friendly uh, open door, man, it, it is an expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because before they can ever hear the gospel, they actually got to see the gospel in action as a hospitality. We want, we want you here. So I have a video to kick us off. It should be pretty funny with a little kid, and it'll be right there. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, that's on my saved reels that my kids watch because I think it's so funny. This little kid is engaging the morning, you know, good morning, hello. And even the, the dad or uh, the parent who's watching it is, is giggling. He's like, what is that kid doing? But I think a lot of us look at that video and it's sweet and it, it ministers to our heart on some level. Um, we think it's funny. Why? Because people don't act like that. I mean, as life comes at you and wears on you, you're not saying good morning. It's like, Here, here's another one, right? It's coming at me, and I'm, I'm, I'm having, dealing, having trouble dealing with myself. How am I going to greet anyone else? And that's what uh, we hope to accomplish this morning is the warmth of a welcoming. It says this in Romans 15, 7, that therefore welcome, listen, that welcome one another. Why? As Christ has welcomed you. So that's, that's the heart work. If we're going to really be a welcoming church, we really have to double click on how has Christ indeed welcomed me. Now listen to this. For the glory of God. Now this is so weighty. 
This is so weighty. We, as we welcome people, have this hospitality in spirit, we are displaying the glory of God. What does that mean? This is weighty. We are representing the character of God in how we welcome people. Isn't that weighty? Like God uh, is represented by, by, by his body, his church family, by how we welcome people. Now, we're gonna see the beauty of that, but the high responsibility when people look at us and man, they, they see the character of God, that God is welcoming, um, that he is loving, that he's kind, that he's long-suffering, that, that he wants you, those types of things, in how we live. And this is going to deeply tie into uh, having the joy set found on Jesus Christ. See, a lot of us can't welcome people and we're not happy. Why? Because we're always looking at what's going on right in front of our, our, our face instead of getting our eyes down the road, so to speak, on the horizons of the glory of Jesus Christ, which is constant and clear. That's where joy comes from. And we can actually be a welcoming people if our hope is set on Christ. And so that's our desire this morning is that we'd see the welcome of Christ and particularly for us. And therefore, we would welcome people as Christ has indeed welcomed uh, you and me. So James 2, we're going to pick up there. We're going to look at verse 1. It says, my brothers, listen, my brothers show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So what he's saying is that we should not show partiality, that we should not uh, pick one group of people better than the, the next group of people. This is the unwelcoming spirit. This is a judgmental spirit that you are going to take the, the, the judgment seat of God, which is only God's alone, and saying, you know what? I'll be nice to you. I'll welcome you. But to this group of people, not so much. He said there should be no partiality. Another way you can say it, uh, what James is spelling out is, is this. Faith in Jesus Christ and favoritism is completely incompatible. If you show favoritism in any way of social snobbery, you don't really get the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's saying that you're not representing the Lord of glory. This is against the very character and nature of God is what it's saying. So we should not show partiality. So if we're going to be a welcoming uh, church, we're going to have to understand that we can't be partial. Why? Because God is not partial. And praise God for that. Verse 2. It says this, for, a, for if, so it gives us a case study, really, two through three. For if a man uh, wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, so that's our gathering, he, uh, so he's a rich man, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the, uh, to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down uh, sat down at my feet, um, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So it gives us this litmus test of partiality or this case study. You got a rich man and a poor man, and there's a sit by me test. Who do you gravitate to? So you, it, it may be a rich and poor person for you, uh, but it's usually like, who do you think can, can help you right, gain the position that you want? So for some of us, that is money. But some of it's social status, some of that is different things that you hold on to. But there's a sit-by-me test that you should look for yourself. If you're like, I want to sit by them and not by them, you're operating in partiality. And here's the deal. I am tempted to partiality. I remember in a Sunday school class, um, March and I first got married, we were talking, I don't know if it was on this text, and like, who are the people you like to hang around with? And I just raised my hand. I answered like, I like to be around people like me. And they're like, you, did you say that out loud? And I was like, yeah, I, I, that, that's my default mode. I want to be around people that think like me, that look like me, that don't challenge me. And here's the deal. So do you. That's how we think. That's how we act. And it's saying this is the opposite of the spirit of God that we should not be partial based on appearance, on accents, on age, on affluence, on our ancestry or affinities or achievements. But we all have a tendency to biases, namely partiality, which is against the very character of God. And if you don't see it, you have it, and you're completely blind to it. And I pray the Spirit of God would open your mind and your heart this morning that you have blind spots and you are, you are partial. And apart from the Spirit of God and really Christ moving more towards you, you'll never be challenged in your, in your, 
and your partiality. So verse 4, because I think a lot of us are like, well, so I have favoritisms. What's the big deal? Well, listen to the, how, how wicked this is according to what the word of God, not your feelings, but according to the truth of God, how God says this is, this is just the worst. It says, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves? Listen, so that's that distinction. We're creating judgments. We're not having a welcoming environment and become judges, listen, judges with evil thoughts. So when you play favorites, when we, are, or we tend to act in a biased way, which is against the character of God, it's saying, one, it's evil thoughts, and you are putting yourself in place of God, which is the most wicked thing we could do. It's saying that, that you are now playing who is in and who is out, who is in and who, in, who is out game. Without, without saying it, that's what you're doing. As you draw near, when the, the sit by me test, if you're like, I don't want to sit by them, I want to sit by these people. You're saying, I'm in, they're out. And that's the most wicked thing that any of us could do. And it shows us that we're not really comprehending the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no haves and haves nots in this, this assembly. There's no one that has figured it out, not one. The truth is, <laughs> if you think you get it, apart from Jesus Christ, you totally don't get it. That's the truth. If you think in some way that you're better than the next person, it proves that you don't get it at all. It's the gospel is for the have-nots. So I'll give you an illustration, and this may be their, their bias and perception, but also I think the church has warranted this. We got done with our men's conference, which is the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ is this I idea that we should consider uh, people more important than ourselves, and that we should want to serve others. That's the idea of the mind of Christ. And we got done at the men's conference, and I was on my way home, and Marcy called me, and uh, we have a new neighbor, and she was potentially having some diagnosis uh, with cancer, and she was, she was a strot. So she's, she's kind of a, a single, single mom, and, um, and she doesn't have anyone. She was just really talking to Marcy. And she, Marcy called me and said, hey, she's really struggling. We don't really know her. So I just got done with the mind of Christ, and I was like, yeah, I'll pray for her. You know? And then I felt like the Spirit of God, no, you, know, you need to go knock on her door and pray for her. So I did. So I will knock on her door and say, hey, I, I, you know, I, heard, I heard you know you have a big appointment coming up. They're struggling, and... And she's, yes, and she's almost in tears, like, hey, can I, can I pray for you? And so I prayed over her, and I was like, you know what, uh, I'd love to invite you to church. Uh, you don't have to go to our church, but, you know, during a time where you're scared and suffering, God, God sees you, he loves you, I feel like that's why I'm here, to let you know that. And, and this is what she says. She goes, well, I'd love to come, but my, my, my daughter's a homosexual. And I said, well, she can come too, right? And, and the reason why I say that is there's a community that doesn't feel welcome in the church walls. Now, whether that is guilt and shame, because hear me, it is sin, or it's because they've been judged, not according to, to the grace that we've received, but harshly, right? And what I'm not going to do is lower truth. There is sin, and we are all sinners, and the good news is Jesus. So we should welcome everyone, because what, we all sin, we all just sin differently, but that's the idea that was running in her head. Would I be welcomed? And I'm like, yes. And whatever reason you don't think that, we would love for you to join. Um, let's, let's keep going on. So the idea, here's the case study. We have a litmus test, or the sit by me test. You're always gonna draw near to someone, which provides a partiality, or another way to say it, a unwelcoming spirit, which is against the very character and nature of God who we're called to represent. It's a huge, huge problem the church should think about. Now, the way that we have gospel growth here in this litmus test, James gives us in verse five, it says, uh, it says this. It says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? That's the number one. If we're going to be a welcoming people, you have to understand this truth, and it's a major one, that God has in, welcomed the poor in the world to be what? Rich in faith. Who is the ones that, that really understand or comprehend Christianity? It's the poor. Not just talking about money. It's talking about, it's talking about your spiritual disposition. The ones that really get Christianity, and I'll challenge this all day, is the one who is poor in spirit. See, um, the, the rich or middle class in spirit will always, I question if they understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the only way that you grab the gospel, that you grab onto, is you have nothing in your hands of self. 
That's the way you get there. But a lot of us are full of self, so we don't ever grab onto Christ. The rich in spirit is not compatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but most of us, a lot of us, are rich in spirit. And I've defined rich in spirit as me and Jesus. Because I think a lot of people come to church like, well, dude, I love Jesus. But your gospel, which is a false gospel, is it's me, that's a lot of self, and Jesus. Like, Jesus is good. Yeah, he provides a little bit of self-help, but you should see how much work I've done. I do a really good job, and I'm full of effort, and I'm full of, of things that I've accomplished. And the rich in spirit, do not grab on to the gospel of Jesus Christ because you're full of yourself. If your gospel is me and Jesus, you will not be a welcoming person. Why? Because you are not judging people according to your sin and the welcomingness that you received in Christ. You're judging people on yourself on things that you think you've done right, and forever doesn't, whoever you think doesn't you know, measure up to what you're doing, who, what are you going to do? You're going to judge them. At least I've never done that. I don't struggle that way. That You're going to produce a, a spirit of partiality. Now, middle class in spirit, it's, 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 well, yeah, it's Jesus and me. So I have the, the you know, rich in spirit. It's, 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 it's me. That's more clear. It's very self-righteous. Uh, but me and, uh, Jesus and me is a little bit more stealth. You say a lot of Jesus' words, but you're still in there. Is that the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus plus anything equals nothing. No, that's, that's, that's false gospel. And you will not be a welcoming person. Why? Because you're still in the equation. See, the idea that he's getting across here is this idea of, of understanding your, your bankruptcy, your poorness, that you're a beggar. Now, most of us, listen to me, don't think of us ourselves as spiritual beggars. But according to the word of God and the, the holiness of God and, and where, you're at, where you're at on your own, that's what you are. That's what I am. I'm a beggar. <laughs> I am completely spiritually bankrupt. This is what it says in Matthew 5, 3. This is, this is the people that actually become Christians. Blessed are what? in the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The people that understand they have nothing apart from Jesus Christ, they're the ones that gets it. Is that the gospel that you came, for, uh, came to? That you have, no, you have no negotiating. If you ever meet that someone has nothing in the bank account, is there any negotiation? No. It's just, I need help. I need, I need all your help. Your grace is all I got. Is that how you've come to Jesus? If you haven't come to him that way, I'm saying you've never come to Christ. You've never come. It's just the, that is the gospel. It says this in James 1.9. If you just look at, uh, at the same page but over, it's my favorite, one of my favorite verses on the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why we preach Jesus. We try to keep it the center of, of, of every sermon and everything we do. But in James 1, 9, it says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. So there's some of you coming in right now that are so beat up, that are so in despair, so disgusted by your sin that you are just completely like, how could God love me? And this is a great verse for you. It says, let that brother look to his exaltation in Jesus Christ. Like some of us think that, man, I am, I am so bad. How could God love me? You got to look at, oh, because of Jesus. That's how he loves me. That's, that's my exaltation. And there's other people. It says in the rich, in the humiliation. There's so many people that you think, I'm so good. I've got it going on. And it says you need to what? Look to your humiliation. You need to understand that you are the worst, that you're the worst, that you're the chief sinner before you grab onto Christ. See, Christ speaks to two different people groups. The lowly says, you're not that bad in the sense that you're not too far from my reach. Why? Because I die for you. He tells the, the, the rich brother of self, he's like, you're not as good as you think. You're so bad that I had to die for you. If you understand that, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it changes your heart. You'll have the warmth of a welcoming spirit. Why? Because that's how you've come in. But by no partiality of yourself. You didn't do anything. It's only on the merits of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say... Uh, in verse 5, it says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? And listen, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the, uh, blaspheme the, honor, uh, the honorable name by which you were called? I really want to focus in on the rich in faith and then heirs of the kingdom. 
The way that the church has a warmth and welcome is it's clearly a gospel spirit, which is a poor in spirit. That's how you come to Christ. You got to confess you have nothing. Secondly, that we can display, we can display the warmth of welcoming in really, I would say, as Jesus is king, that we are heirs of the kingdom. See, God's economy, namely Jesus' economy, is much different than the world's economy. And as we see that, what does it do? It produces a welcoming spirit. Because as we say, the down and outs are welcome. The down and outs are welcome here, that you are now new in Jesus Christ and God has a plan for you. The world doesn't work that way. The world will say, you can be here as long as you're good enough. What we say is you can be here as long as you understand you're not good enough. That's God's kingdom. Now, that's completely different. And as we display Jesus is king and his economy, we're supposed to be a little embassy representing who Jesus is like, of the future kingdom that Christ will display, uh, fully uh, uh, fulfill when he returns, but we get to display it here and now, and this is what this community looks like, the warmth of welcoming no matter who comes in there and confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are positionally not a sinner, but they're a son. They belong to Jesus, that we are righteous in Christ. So I don't care if you've murdered someone or, you know, if, if you are been a good person your whole life and you, you say the church word cuss words. Your position is found on what? On Jesus Christ, Christ alone, and God has a plan for you, and he wants to use you in this local body. That is a different way display the kingdom of God to the world that doesn't understand him. So how do we model this unity and diversity that we're positionally righteous in Christ and that God has a plan for each person in this, this, this building? We're, we're an assembly sent on mission, as again, to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ, is that we model unity and diversity. So a lot of times you may look around and say, ah, we're not a very diverse church. I would argue completely opposite. We are one of the most diverse churches you'll ever be around. You know why? Because everyone is coming usually from a different religious background. I can't tell you, you know, Baptists, recovering Baptists, and Church of Christ, and Catholics, and all different types of religions, uh, non denominations in this one facility. We're not one in denomination. And so you talk to them, they got a lot of different ideas coming in. Number two, a lot of different po political ideas. I mean, <laughs> the more I went through 2020, I'm like, oh my goodness. And everyone's looking next to you and saying, I didn't know you believed that. How did you get in here? Christ is how we got in here, right? Unity in diversity. We got jocks. We got tech, techies. We got, you know, artists. We got introverts. We got extroverts. We got all kinds of different people in here. And how are we modeling Christ? Because our position's found in Christ and Christ alone. That's why we're in here. And if that's not why in here, it's a matter of time before you leave. There is a church about other things. We're not going to be that church. We're going to be a church that's built on Christ. Number two, we're positionally righteous in Christ. And listen, we're equipped in Christ to play different roles. That God wants to, to this, this body to mature by your gifting by the Spirit of God. And we try to, as elders and ministers, equip you to be the church, not only here, but into uh, your local communities. And if you understand that, there is no greater position than any other position. It's just not why our position is found in Jesus Christ. Um, as I mentioned, the hospitality, I think one of the greatest things we have going for our church is our hospitality team. I, I truly believe that, early on especially, because I was horrible at preaching, and I sweated a ton, and it was not good. Jesus was good, so be clear on that. The only reason people came back is because they felt loved and welcome as they came in. And they would tell me that to my face. Like, yeah, you could, you could grow, but I felt loved. That's good, right? Number two, man, we're, the, 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 the kids' ministry is huge. I remember as I was getting a seminary degree, I was graduating seminary, I was at a church. And I was like, hey, you, you could use me. I probably could teach a theological class for you if you want that. Or I could do something really great for you in my mind. And I was like, you know where we need you? We need you in the kids' ministry. I was like, not what I was thinking. Not what I was, not, not what I was thinking at all. But in that, man, it was a beautiful time to share the gospel with these kids and know their names and pray over them and get to know their families, right? That's God's economy. So in my mind, seminary degree equals this. Seminary degree meant, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go serve the least of these in the mindset of the world. That says something different when we're willing. I hope that you have that disposition. I wrote some names down here just to show you the position of Christ. Christ qualifies. You never know where God will lead you. I have Jackie Mulligan here. She was she, you know, she was in the workplace and she's a stay-at-home mom, but then God called her into the women's ministry. 
And she always, I I don't think she minds, she always feels unqualified. But man, she is gifted at teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she loves you women. Who equipped her for that? Is she qualified for that? The answer is probably not according to the world's economy. But according to the spirit of God, yes and amen. And she's crushing it. Dude, we got Mark McPherson who preached last week, who was a wrestling coach three years ago. (laughs) Three years ago. Now he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. On a world standard, does that make sense? It should not make sense. How, how, How does that work? That's God's economy and the kingdom of God on display. I have other ones in here. I'll just stop there. But those should be people that he's like, oh, if God's using them, he can use me. And that doesn't mean a place of exaltation. We're called to serve the people where God puts you. Um, this is the priority of Jesus as a king and Jesus' economy. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to behold. And the world just scratched their heads like, how is that happening? How is that happening? The warmth of a welcome in verse, uh, warmth of welcoming verses 8 through 12, and really verse 8, I'm going to double click on for a second, is the priority of kindness. Priority of kindness. <laughs> you and I should be known for what our priority in kindness. Why? Because the word of God says that. Not judgment, not even that we got the truth right all the time, but what's our priority? It's kindness. I hope that overflows into your mind. It says, if you, listen, if you really, so James is challenging. Are, if you really fulfill the royal, uh, royal law, which is Jesus' law, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So if you really want to show that you're getting it, if you want to know that you're grasping the gospel, it says you should love what your neighbor as yourself. That's how you know. It's not a how many scriptures you memorize, although I'm for that. It's by how you love what? Your neighbor. That's amazing. You know who said this? <laughs> who also said this, Jesus. He said this in Matthew 22, verse 36 and 30. It says, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So he's like, hey, what's the best out of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like, uh, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. It says, man, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The priority of kindness to your neighbor. And that's not people like you. That's people made in the image of God that God cares deeply about. That's how you know that the gospel is penetrating your own heart. There is integrity to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the character on display on how you treat people that are different than you. <laughs> that, that are different than you. That sh- shows the heart of Christ. Verses 9 and 11 says, here's, here's how severe it is if you're not doing this. Uh, it says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of, of, it, uh, of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do not murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So what it's saying is, if you do not have the spirit of welcoming, and you have a spirit of judgment, you're not priority of kindness, which is Christ's uh, priority. The severity is as as if you have, have broken all of the law, and it's the same judgment for you as someone who's committed adultery as a murderer. So if you got up, it's like, me yes, I wasn't kind today, not a big deal. Is that what the word of God just said? No. No, it says, if you've done that, you're as if these, these people, the people that you think that you're better than, you're the same as them. That's the idea. But then what's amazing here, it says, it tells us how to operate, uh, verse 12. It says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. It's a beautifully crafted verse, the law of liberty. This is one thing that the Lord willing that you'll always hear at the door church. We believe in the word of God and we never want to lower the law of God. Why? Because that's the character of God on display. Like we believe that you should not murder. We should believe that you should not commit adultery. We believe the truths of God. The issue is, is that we will always fall short in ourselves 
of the character of God. What's the law of liberty? That Jesus sets us free from the judgment of the law. That he gives us freedom, not to be judged by the law, but the judgment he has taken for us. And now, we don't have to keep the law. I'm going to say that again. You don't have to keep the law to be accepted and loved by God. But when you understand the law of liberty, that Jesus Christ indeed took our judgment, listen, you'll want to. He changes your heart's desire. Not that you have to, you'll want to represent <laughs> the character of God to others. Why? Because that's what you've received. The warmth of welcoming the cross of Christ. Verse 13 could sum up the whole sermon of if we're truly going to be a welcoming church, what God's designed us to be. So for the judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Listen, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Why are we a welcoming people? Why? Because the cross is a welcome sign to you. That's why. That's why we are going to be a welcoming people, because mercy, God's mercy in Jesus Christ, has trampled over the judgment that you and I deserve. When you look to the cross of Christ, you should see the, 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 the open arms of God to you, a sinner. And that should take your breath away. What you deserve is judgment, guilt, shame, rejection. We are the outsiders. But Jesus Christ, in his judgment, says, no, you are loved and you're accepted. You're pardoned and you're welcomed in the family of God. His mercy, Jesus' mercy has triumphed over judgment. And the only way that you're going to be welcoming to a stranger, namely someone different than you, is you're going to, see, you're going to have to see God in Jesus Christ is always moving towards you to welcome you and love you where you're at. So by God's grace, you will love people where they're at. That's how that happens. You look to the cross of Christ. You look to the cross of Christ that, man, he loves you. Why? Because he loves you. Now, that should humble you. Again, some of you think you're pretty good. The cross of Christ says you're not. You're not. Not even close. And some of you are so beat up over yourself. And this is where really my mind goes, like, how could God love me? I still struggle. I still, you know, what, why? I have to remind myself, because mercy tri triumphs over judgment, because of Jesus. That's my only plea is Jesus. And as I understand that love, that love uh, transformed me and then sends me out into loving people. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us respond to your word appropriately by singing and praising the glories of Jesus Christ, that we are welcome, that you welcome sinners, and we're not stuck in our sin, but we're forgiven, we're loved, we're given a new name. God, I pray that you would humble us to be poor in spirit, not unto despair, but to be exalted in the riches and position of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we would look at the cross and see that you are literally opening your arms to sinners and say, Come in, come in, you are welcome. And that we'd feel the acceptance and the peace of Christ. And that he totally bore all of our judgment. And there is no more condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. I pray that people believe that and receive that this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.